Now before we jump into making the famous Don Angie pinwheel lasagna, currently the hottest and hardest to get lasagna in New York City, we first have to make and show the bechamel and the bolognese. I want to thank our sponsor today, Comatier, but more on them later. For now, this recipe starts a day in advance. This is Don Angie, one of the hottest restaurants in New York City. You simply just cannot get a reservation. I've been there once and it is one of my favorite restaurants. They're known for their inventive takes on Italian American classics, which earned them a Michelin star. So today we'll be cooking from this cookbook, Italian American by Scott Tassinelli and Angie Rito, the power couple behind Don Angie. And this is my favorite book. I've never ripped through a cookbook with such excitement that broke me out of a feeling that I should only teach regional Italian classics and allowed me to realize what it means to cook Italian American and to make a dish your own. They have many show-stopping items at Don Angie, but the star attraction is this pinwheel lasagna designed for two, which we'll be making today. And there are several elements to this recipe we need to make, so we're just going to take it one element at a time. But this book should be required reading for all of you. Now let's just jump into the Italian sausage bolognese, which starts with onion, garlic, celery, and carrots. We're basically just going to take them and we're going to roughly break them down and get them into a food processor. I know a lot of you'd be like, well, why do I have to chop them up if we're going in a food processor? It's just going to blitz them up better. You can't just throw whole carrots and onions in there and expect it to come out the way you want. So we're just going to get them in the food processor, pulse them until they break down into about the size of rice. We kind of want them to match the texture of the ground meat that we're going to be using in the bolognese. Now, typically for a bolognese, what's required is the inclusion of pancetta, either a beef or a veal, a pork, white wine, milk, and very little tomato. So with that, their recipe, taking a little bit more of an Italian-American spin, the center focus is going to be on Italian sausage and veal, about one pound of each. And then we're going with about four ounces of pancetta, which is typical in a bolognese. And this is already ground up. We're just gonna blitz this into the food processor we just used. And then we have all of our ingredients ready to go and to get cooking. Just add that to the food processor and break that down until it's about the same consistency as the ground veal and the ground sausage. Then we're gonna take two cans of whole peeled tomato. Usually I'll run them through a food mill, but for this, we can just throw them into the food processor and break them down until they're a puree. This is what we got. We got our meats, our vegetables, our tomato. We've got some tomato paste, a little white wine, some whole milk, and a star anise. They add it because they say it adds a meatiness to meat. And I'm not a big anise flavored guy, but when I made it, it does really add something that I almost didn't want to like, but you just do. It works. It definitely adds a nice little thing that if you would think about trying this without adding this, I'd say just add it first, see if you like it. If you don't like it, then next time you can omit it. Let's head on over to the stove. So we wanna get a heavy bottom Dutch oven on the stove. On about medium heat, we wanna get a little bit of olive oil to coat the bottom of the pan, and then we're gonna get the veal and the sausage in. We're gonna season with salt, and we're gonna use a flat bottom wooden spoon, and stirring frequently, we're gonna break up that meat into little bits. And we know when we do this, that ground beef is first going to release water and start boiling, like you see here. You'll be able to hear a boiling sound at this point. And at this stage, you're just cooking it to evaporate all of that moisture so that we can then move into a second phase of frying the meat, which you will also be able to hear. The sound will go from that boiling sound to a frying and popping sound. And then we're just gonna cook this until the meat browns nicely. We wanna see a little bit of fond developing on the pan, but I am noticing that the fond is developing on, on the bottom of the pan faster than the meat is browning, which I don't love. So I'm gonna take a little bit of wine, I'm gonna deglaze that bottom of the pan just to buy me more time. And once there's enough fond developed on the pan and the meat's nice and browned, I'm gonna take a slotted spoon and just sort of get the meat out of the pan. And then we're gonna go in with the pancetta. We're just gonna break that pancetta up, probably gonna lower the heat down slightly, and we just wanna render out the pancetta fat and release that into the pan and brown the pancetta. And once that fat is released and the pancetta starts to brown, then we wanna add our vegetables. And there's all this moisture from those pureed vegetables that's going to help deglaze and pick up all of those brown bits and that fond on the bottom of the pan. So you wanna go in with the vegetables and mix that in, and you wanna cook the vegetables for about 10 to 15 minutes. And again, we wanna cook them 
moisture out of the vegetables and then start to develop a little bit of color on the bottom of the pan. So once that moisture has cooked off and the vegetables begin to brown a bit, then we wanna go in with a half cup of the tomato paste. We wanna work that tomato paste into the vegetables. We wanna brown it. We wanna activate it. We wanna let it cook for about five minutes, get it really well incorporated into the vegetables and start to caramelize on the bottom of the pan. And once we cook the vegetables and the tomato paste for about five minutes and we've got a nice fond developing on the pan, then we can deglaze with about a cup of the white wine. Pick up anything left that's stuck on the bottom of the pan, return the meat back into the pan, get it mixed up into the tomato paste. Then we're just gonna add two cups of milk. We're gonna get that worked in. Then we can add our pureed tomato and we can get that star anise in there. And then we just wanna bring that up to a simmer. We wanna drop the heat down and we wanna cook this on a very low simmer for about two hours. So now that the sauce is on the stove simmering, we can get started on the bechamel. Again, both of these things need to be cooked ahead of time and cooled. If you make these pinwheel lasagnas with the bechamel and the bolognese hot, it's gonna be very difficult to do. So we're gonna get this done ahead of time and we're gonna make a really flavorful bechamel. The way they do their bechamel is a real kind of chef way to do it by infusing the milk and the butter with all these delicious flavors. Some garlic, some shallot, some bay leaf, some black peppercorn, some time, all of these things are gonna bring a really intense flavored bechamel that's gonna take this thing to another level. So first we just need to chop up some shallot and some garlic. Let's take a shallot and we just wanna cut that thin. We don't want it too thick, we want it to cook fast and infuse into that milk. We're gonna smash a couple cloves of garlic and then we're gonna get two cups of milk measured out. And then we've got all of our ingredients. And then in a pot, we're gonna get it on about medium heat and we're gonna melt in one stick of butter. And I'm stirring the sauce constantly to make sure nothing catches to the bottom of the pan and burns. Once that butter's melted, we're gonna add some thyme, we're gonna add a quarter teaspoon of whole peppercorns, a bay leaf, the shallots, and the garlic. And we're just gonna cook that until the onions and the garlic have softened and are translucent. Then you wanna add a half cup of flour and you wanna work that in, and what you just made was a roux. And then cook that till it turns a nice golden brown and the raw flour flavor is cooked out. About five minutes. Once you've reached that stage, then you wanna start to slowly incorporate the milk. Their recipe calls for two cups, but I found two cups made it too tight of a bechamel. So I added maybe another cup, cup and a half to loosen it out. Hit it with some salt and we just want it to be a little ribbony as it flows off of a spatula. Then we wanna cool it, strain that through a fine mesh strainer to filter everything out from the bechamel. And then we're gonna put it into an airtight container and store it in the fridge overnight. Now, before we move forward, I gotta make sure you're drinking good coffee thanks to our sponsor today, Comatier. Comatier is a pour over quality coffee from some of the world's best specialty coffee roasters, brewed 10 times stronger and delivered in frozen recyclable aluminum capsules. The brewed coffee is immediately flash frozen into these pucks to lock in freshness and flavor. It's a completely new format of coffee. Then all you have to do is add six to eight ounces of hot water and melt the puck and you've got instant coffee that tastes like a barista just brewed a cup in your own home. All the brewing's already been done for you. Maybe you like an iced coffee, you can make that as well. What I like about Comatier is you can make almost any type of coffee that you want from these little pots. You don't need any special gear, there's no real cleanup, and best of all, it tastes delicious. And unlike instant coffee, Comatier's never concentrated, evaporated, or dried, so you lose no flavor from being to cup. And best of all, at a dollar a cup, you can save money without sacrificing quality. And for a very limited time, Comatier is offering my audience a huge discount of 50% off your first order, plus free shipping when you use the code NOTANOTHER50 at comatier.com backslash NOTANOTHER. So go down, get the deal, try out some Comatier coffee, let's jump back into the rest. So now while we're waiting, we might as well bang out the pasta dough and give it some time to rest overnight. So we're gonna get started making the Don Angie Northern style egg pasta dough. It's got seven to nine egg yolks, one whole egg, and it uses one cup of double zero flour and then one cup of Durham wheat semolina flour. And they advise on making it in a stand mixer, which I'm going to do. So we just go on with a cup of each flour, get that mixed up, and then we're gonna toss that whole egg into the mix. Then we're gonna get the stand mixer on and we're gonna slowly add one egg yolk at a time. Sort of replicating the, the well method of making pasta dough where you're slowly working in the egg yolk into the dough. Now they said that this dough should come together when squeezed and be a little dry, but this is definitely too dry. I know that for a fact. So I'm just gonna wet my hands, get the dough out onto the board and just work the moisture from my hands into the dough and then we're gonna get it wrapped and we're gonna let that rest overnight in the mm. fridge. It's been two hours. We now have to put the finishing touches on the bolognese. See, it's nice and thick and this is sort of what we want. We need something that's gonna be 
maintained. We need a few finishing touches. We're gonna give it a taste. I think the salt is good for now. I'm gonna add a few other ingredients that they call for. One of which is being a touch of fish sauce. About a teaspoon or two. So I'm just gonna do, boop, boop. A little bit of lemon. Just like a little quarter of a lemon. Just to bring back some fresh acidity. And they add sugar to their sauce, but I really don't think it needs any sugar. Those Bianco Di Napoli tomatoes are so sweet and delicious that I'm not going to add any. One more taste. My fresh lemon juice really adds a nice thing. A little bit more salt, and we're gonna let this cool. Once it's cooled, get them into some containers. These core containers are great. You can find them on Amazon. Then just wanna pop them into the fridge and let them chill overnight. So we banged out a bechamel sauce, we banged out a bolognese sauce, and we banged out our pasta dough, and that's all resting in the fridge now. So when we wake up in the morning, we can throw it all together very easily, and we should be good to go. So I'll see you in the morning. So here we are the next day and our dough is ready. So we can just start to roll these out. I'm also gonna get a big pot of water boiling. That's gonna fit some sheets in it. So I need a big guy. Now just unwrap the dough and cut it into quarters and then get the rest of the dough back wrapped so it doesn't dry out. And then just work with it at a quarter of the dough at a time. And we wanna flatten it so it's gonna feed through the pasta roller easier. And we wanna start at the widest opening, which is usually zero. And I'm gonna roll it through once, fold it onto itself to create a wider shape. We want these to end up being about 12 to 7 inch pasta sheets. So we need them to fit the width of the pasta machine. So we're just gonna work it, folding it onto itself until we've got a nice shape. And then we can start to roll it out, making our way up all the way to level seven on the pasta machine, which I believe is the second thinnest layer. It wasn't wide enough for me when I got there, so I just folded it back onto itself to create a wider sheet, and then just ran it back through the pasta machine until I got a wide enough dough that's gonna work for this recipe. This is definitely a drier dough. Usually when you see the edges of the pasta dough fray like that, it usually means it's a little drier, which is fine, but this dough is a bit difficult to work. Then we're gonna get it onto a board and we're gonna cut 12 by seven inch sheets. And then we're just gonna make our way through the rest of the dough. You're basically just looking for two sheets that are gonna lay on top of each other that are basically the same size and shape. So we're just gonna start with these two sheets. Again, dough's a little bit drier than I would hope. You don't ever want it to fray like that, but this is gonna work. First we gotta do is now we gotta cook these. What I need is I got myself a towel. I'm gonna pull them out. This is what I'm gonna dry the sheets on. You could use an ice bath to get them out, but I found we're gonna cook them for only about 15 seconds each, 15, 20 seconds. So by the time I pull it out, get it on here to dry, it cools down rather fast, so I'm not too worried about it overcooking. Although their recipe calls for putting it into an ice bath when it comes out. And then we're gonna heavily salt it with about a cup of salt because we're only gonna let them sit in the salt water for a very short amount of time. We can over salt the water. And then some sheets of parchment paper so that we can hold the cooked pasta sheets once they're done without them sticking to each other. So once that water is boiling, I'm gonna get that towel off to the side, ready to dry the pasta sheets, and I'm gonna start to cook the pasta sheets one at a time, only for about 15 to 20 seconds, literally. And then you wanna pull them out, pull right onto the towel. I ripped this guy right here, but that's totally fine. I just used the wrong utensil. That rip won't be an issue at all. And then we're gonna go through and just cook off all of those pasta sheets. And then when we get them out, we just give them a quick dry, and then we place them onto the parchment paper so that they won't stick. So now you just kind of keep this process up as you would go and bang out the rest of the pasta dough, but we're just gonna work with these two. So we've got our bechamel, our bolognese, we've got some shredded whole milk mozzarella. I might need more, but I have this, I gotta use it. And then some grated 18 to 24 month Parmigiano Reggiano. These are all the elements of the pinwheel lasagna itself. So we're gonna get started throwing those together. So what we're gonna first do is just make sure you have a nice clean surface. Then we're gonna go with the first, Pair, and I'm gonna want the smaller, if there is a smaller one, I want that on the inside. And then for that one with the damaged pasta sheet, I obviously want the one that's undamaged at the bottom. I was sort of able to patch it up, but that's gonna go on top of that guy. First layer, the bechamel. We're gonna go with about a quarter cup of bechamel on each side. Smear that evenly across the entire sheet of pasta. On top of that, we're gonna go in with the Parmigiano Reggiano, but we're gonna leave a two inch border at the very top of the sheet. 
And then on top of that, we're going with a very thin layer of the mozzarella, maybe a cup. Then we're gonna place the second sheet right on top of that and press it into that bechamel to seal it. And then at the very top, we're gonna put another layer of, of that bechamel glue. And then below that, we're gonna put about a cup of bolognese thinly spread out across the rest of the sheet. And then we just begin to roll that tightly up into a log. It's okay if stuff spills out, we can just push it back in. And then we're gonna gently place the log onto a parchment or a plastic wrap and we can just wrap it up, keep it tight. And we're gonna throw that onto sheet trays and let them cool. Now I'm gonna let these rest in the refrigerator to tighten back up so then we can cut them and keep that nice shape and then we can bake them off. Now the last main element of the dish is a simple tomato sauce. They have a 10 minute tomato sauce in their cookbook. We're just gonna make weekday sauce, which you know and love on the channel. Starts off with some garlic, some basil stems, and, and some whole peeled Bianco Di Napoli tomatoes that we run through a food mill. We slice the garlic up very thin, then we get some olive oil in a pan on about medium high heat, and then we get that garlic and basil stem infused into the oil, a little bit of salt, and once we get a nice color on that garlic, we go in with the tomatoes, we cook that at a simmer until a lot of that moisture has cooked out and it's a nice thick consistency. I think we can remove that cooked basil and then we're just gonna throw in some fresh basil to steep that and get a little nice fresh basil scent at the end. We can just keep hold that off to the side and keep it warm. The final two elements are some parsley. We just gotta get some leaves that we're gonna roll up sort of in a chiffonade. We're gonna layer them and then roll them and then slice them into thin strips. And then their recipe calls for robiola, robiolina cheese, which is sort of like an Italian cream cheese. That's a little harder to find for me, so I'm gonna use mascarpone, which is a very similar thing. And add a little bit of salt and just give it a quick little whip up just to lighten it up, and then put it into a piping bag ready to pipe on at the end. And now we're ready to cut the pinwheels. So we're gonna unroll our logs. I'm gonna take a baking dish. I like these smaller over ones that'll be enough for two people and just add a thin layer of the tomato sauce right on the bottom of the baking dish. Then we're gonna cut the logs. We're gonna first cut one slice down the middle. And then we're gonna cut each half into half so that each log creates four pieces of pinwheel lasagna. And then just arrange those pieces in the lasagna baking dish prettiest side facing up. I'll cut another piece from that second log I have just to fill out the rest of the baking dish. And the rest I'll fill up into a separate baking dish the same way for leftovers. I mean, look how beautiful that is. And we're gonna bake this on a sheet tray just to catch any overflow there might be. Now I'm gonna bake this for 20 to 30 minutes at 400 degrees. And what I'm looking for is this top to get nice and crispy across the top, very top of each piece of the lasagna. And then everything's bubbly and hot. That's really it. Then we're gonna pipe in a little of the mascarpone, a little bit of the parsley, and we're ready to go. And it goes for 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes, I'm gonna give it a check. And there's some browning, but not as much as I'd like. So I'm gonna put it back in the oven and give it another 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, I'm gonna pull it out. I'm gonna pipe some of that mascarpone cheese in any of these like kind of open spaces around the pinwheel lasagnas. And then I'm gonna get that back in the oven under the broiler this time, just for 20, 30 seconds, just to warm up the cheese. And then we're ready to go. Hit it with some fresh parsley. Instead of trying to get an impossible reservation at Don Angie, you've got pinwheel lasagna in your home. Serve a couple of them up. They're really easy to portion. And you get to enjoy crispy lasagna in every bite, which is the genius behind this recipe. I have to be honest with you, when I first had it, and when I first heard about this pinwheel lasagna, I thought it was gimmicky. I didn't really understand it until I tried it. Now having tried it and having made it a few times, I do believe this is um, somewhat of an evolution and an innovation to lasagna. The form factor works. You can see how that, that top layer gets so crispy. And we all know that the crunchy part of the lasagna is some of the best part of the lasagna. So you get that crunch in every bite. So if you wanna grab the recipe, I'll leave a link down to buy Don Angie's cookbook. And I'll leave a link down to the recipe version that I'm going to make for this that sort of expands on something. That's all that I have today. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and go feed yourself. I think it's time you might want to brush up on some cacio pepe. I just made a new video teaching various methods on how to create the creamiest cacio pepe that you've ever had. I guarantee it. Give it a shot and thanks for watching.